Uncle Whit and Dad made everyone who worked here understand and appreciate hard work. Whit always said he wanted to get in a position where he could make a living with his mind and not with his back. And that's such a simple thing to say, but coming from their background, it makes a lot of sense. Well, they grew up on a farm in Prattsville, Arkansas. It was a pretty hard upbringing. As the country sank into the Great Depression, Witt discovered a calling as a salesman, selling Bibles and belt buckles across the countryside. Guided by his father, A.J. Stevens, Witt obtained a seed loan to form W.R. Stevens Investments and began buying Arkansas tax-exempt bonds for as low as 10 cents on the dollar. He was extremely bright financial concepts that others of us go to grad school to learn, he had innately. He saw firsthand in the Depression what excessive debt could do to a company, a family. I think that had a lasting effect on wit. He bought the Arkansas municipal bonds for pennies and they repaid at par. Make no mistake, he was an American original. Because of Witt's success, my father was able to go to Columbia Military Academy, and then he went to the Naval Academy. In 1946, Jack graduated from the Naval Academy as part of a storied class that included President Jimmy Carter, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Admiral William Crow, and CIA Director Admiral Stansfield Turner. U.S. Ambassador to the European Union, Vernon Weaver, was Jack's roommate and became one of his closest friends and confidants for over 60 years. When Dad was graduating, his plan was go to New York and try to get a job on Wall Street. Whip said, well, don't do that. Join me, and I'll make you a 50-50 partner. And they shook hands, and that was the basis for their partnership. Whit always said it was the smartest decision he ever made. It was that handshake between two brothers that formed Stevens, Inc. Witt had the line on buying what became Stevens Production Company, but it was my father that actually helped get it financed. Stevens Production Company was one of the original leverage buyouts at the time, and it was one of the first private equity investments that the Stevens family made. It was an oil and gas field up around the Arkansas-Oklahoma border. Jack and Witt bought that in the early 50s for less than $2 million. A large portion of that purchase price was borrowed. That field has generated well over a billion dollars worth of cash returns. It's been the source of a lot of the capital we've had to reinvest. Continuing to diversify in the oil and gas industry in the 1950s, the family made an investment in the fledgling Arkansas-Louisiana Gas Company, the natural gas utility in the state. Every home on our system will have a supply of natural gas. Witt became the CEO of the newly acquired entity, while Jack became president and CEO of Stevens, Inc. Yet both men retained a 50-50 share in the firm. It was 1956, and Jack began to grow Stevens by providing private equity to many young growing companies, as well as trading corporate securities. Systematics was one of the most successful startup companies we've ever been an investor in. Jack owned an insurance company here in town, Union Life. He bought the first 
mainframe computer in the state. They were very proud of it, and they gave my father a tour. Someone said, but we're only using 30% of this machine's capacity. And Dad, in his very subtle way, said, well, what the hell are we doing with the rest of it? In fact, they had to tell him that he had bought too much computer. That set his creative mind turning. He asked, well, what can we do with the excess capacity? Our operation was pretty much inefficient. We became convinced that with the proper people, our operation could be vastly improved. The banking industry was going through the very beginnings of a revolution. At that time, checks were processed by hand. The idea of a magnetic strip along the bottom of the check was just in its infancy. And we thought most small banks are not going to be able to upgrade. And what they decided to do was to use this mainframe to do data processing for smaller commercial banks, country banks. That became systematics, a nationwide powerhouse in bank data processing. That $400,000 investment from 1968 has become billions of dollars. As a result of our analysis, systematics developed. Dad would always say that's a great example of how being in Arkansas and dealing with smaller companies or smaller banks led directly to that idea. Wall Streets of the world weren't even thinking about that. In the late 1960s, the National Football League granted a franchise to the city of New Orleans with the understanding that the city would build the team their own stadium. But financing that stadium proved to be a challenge. A group of Wall Street firms indicated their willingness to underwrite 88 million in bonds, but the cost of that stadium was going to be in excess of 100 million, and so it was a real deal killer. We understood Louisiana, and we agreed to underwrite those bonds. The bonds were all sold in 24 hours. It just shows the ability to analyze the situation, the finances of the situation, and get comfortable with it, that we've done that work. Investors are willing to buy the bonds. $113 million bond issue in 1971 was a lot of bonds. Our firm stepped up when Wall Street wouldn't. New Orleans without the Superdome, it probably would be a very different place. In 1962, Sam Walton had a vision of bringing discount stores to smaller towns. But to grow at a rapid pace, his young company, Walmart, needed an influx of capital. For a collaborator, Walton naturally turned to his longtime friend, Jack Stevens. Sam had figured out the magic formula where he could make stores profitable almost immediately. We were doubling in size every other year. Sounds great, but if you want to grow, you need more capital. Sam really valued Jack's counsel. Jack was an extremely brilliant individual who had a vision for where this country was going. Sam began to rely on Jack as to what Walmart should do and they all agreed that the only way to raise the capital that they needed was to do a public offering. The market was beyond terrible. Wasn't like it was a hot deal. There had not been public offering in six months. It was pretty gutsy. Stevens' people were very aggressive and made it happen. Thanks to Stevens, it was a great public offering. Dad was trying to make the transition from being a bond firm to a corporate finance business as well. Walmart's IPO was a turning point for us as a firm. It's been a phenomenal investment. If you'd have bought 100 of those shares in 1970, they'd be worth two and a half million dollars today. Walmart's success story is all about 
delivering value to customers. The Worthen story over the last six years is one of rags to riches, perhaps even a story for Ripley's Believe It or Not. Things were going smoothly until April 1985. Then the roof caved in. When the crisis occurred, overnight bankruptcy at Worthen, it was a lightning strike. People woke up one April morning, 1985, and read the paper, and the largest bank in the state had gone away. There were about $150 million of uninsured deposits in the bank. After the shock, you could kind of see all eyes turning to Jack. It was a public company. Stevens only owned about 15% of it. Jack contemplated what it might mean to the state. I think his point of view became, we're going to lead the charge to fix the state's largest bank. Yeah, it was a real question of whether Worthen was going to make it. We discovered that there were extensive amounts of bad loans. There was an immediate a capital offering led by Warren, Witt, and Jack, that if the shareholders didn't take it up, that they would provide the capital. It took us about four years to absorb the bad loans. I was quoted saying that Worthen was the biggest blot on our investment record. And Dad said, you know, Warren, I think Worthen is going to be our most satisfying investment. I don't think he was talking about financially. He was talking about Worthen was the largest bank in the state. We saved that bank from bankruptcy. It taught me something about standing in there with your clients, with your investments, when things aren't going well. It became one of our best investments ever. Today, the firm continues its focus on relationships, not transactions. Warren learned this firsthand, working closely with his father from the time he joined the firm in 1981. And in 1986, Warren became only the third president and CEO of Stevens, Inc. The relationship with the Tyson family goes back to Don Tyson's father, so John Tyson's grandfather, and my Uncle Whit. The relationship had really helped us. We became his sole financial manager by the time Holly Farms did, came around. When Don Tyson was the CEO, Don's strategy was to go from being a chicken grower to a food company. I had been president four years when Don tells us he believes Holly Farms would be a perfect fit. He wanted to try to buy it. When Don Tyson and Tyson started after Holly Farm, it was a hostile takeover. That deal made some history. ConAgra emerged as a competitor. We had a series of bid counter bids between ConAgra and Tyson for Holly Farms. So that meant that the money that Tyson Foods needed to pay for Holly Farms went from, let's say, 600 million to a billion to easy double. Don Tyson said, Jack, I need $100 million or I can't do this. My banks are leaving me. I can't come to this money. Don and his team had complete trust in our advice, and we obviously felt really good about the deal in recommending that they pay $70 a share because we were willing to put up $100 million to help them do it. Tyson had always grown their firm by making acquisitions. This took them to a completely higher level. ConAgra, big-time New York investment bankers representing them, they got beat. Couldn't have been done without Stevens, Inc. In 1993, we bought Don Ray Media, now called Stevens Media Group, 52 daily newspapers across the country. Through that investment, we have become very familiar with the newspaper industry. 
Don Ray proved to be a success, generating significant cash flow for Stevens. In 2010, Warren and a group of investors started Halifax Media with the acquisition of the Daytona Beach News Journal. We bought the New York Times Regional Newspaper Group, about 20 newspapers, a lot of them in Florida, but Tuscaloosa, Alabama, Gadsden, Alabama, Spartanburg, South Carolina, Wilmington, North Carolina. And in June of 2012, Halifax Media Group agreed to purchase Freedom Communications newspapers, located in Florida and North Carolina. The acquisition further expands Halifax Media's reach in the southeastern United States, growing its Sunday circulation to 752,000. Making investments in newspapers in 2012 is somewhat unusual, but our thesis was simply that community newspapers were going to endure. The multiples are way down from what they historically were, and there's a real value to the local content. They're going to cover the local news, politics, sports, much better than anyone else. Particularly true in small town America. They're true assets in their community and they're viewed that way. We just see a real opportunity there. Stevens has always had the willingness and courage to follow our own convictions. And sometimes that looks contrarian. We look at situations, draw our own conclusions and then act on them. By watching the steady and controlled activity at Stevens Inc., one might never have known that the markets had been closed for nearly a week. Company President Warren Stevens says his employees have been working at getting back to normal since Wednesday. It struck me that if we'd have gone home, we'd have, we'd have just, uh, in a small way, let the terrorists win a, uh, another round, and uh, we weren't going to do that. I have to do what you know I think is right at the time. You know, when the decisions are made, continue doing what our core philosophies are and try to maintain the integrity of the firm. It was a tense day at Stevens Incorporated. Traders worked the phones while keeping a close eye on the latest numbers. Warren Stevens says Americans should be patient. In the long run, the United States and, and its economy are going to continue to lead the world, and our financial markets are going to continue to lead the world. Warren is a reliable capitalist. I think Warren has masterfully guided the company through the continuing evolution and certainly more of a public face on the company than either Will or Jack, particularly around system of free enterprise and capitalism for the benefit not just of our company but of our country. Out of Witt's young municipal bond firm and Jack's leadership into the corporate markets, Warren has grown the company, expanding its footprint into strategic locations across the country as well as overseas. Warren solidified Stephen's stance as a trusted advisor that can help all clients acquire, grow, and preserve capital. The Stevens journey as both a family and a firm exemplifies the power of the free enterprise system. You know, everybody always wonders what happens when the founder is not there any longer, but it's been seamless at Stevens, and I think Warren has done a great job of taking the Stevens culture and building on it and making Stevens into an even better firm. Warren's just like Jack. He's doing the same thing in that business. He has the same qualities that his dad had. The opportunity to be around Dad and to watch him navigate his way through companies that we advise and boards and his friendships. They don't teach that in a book. They don't teach that in a class. But I got to observe it firsthand. And uh, there's no doubt that I'm a much better person and certainly CEO because of the time I got to spend with my dad. There's 70 or 80 active investments in Stevens Capital Partners right now. You see those lessons learned 
in those deals every day. Throughout our history, we've avoided a lot of problems that Wall Street has faced. And I'll continue to do that and stay true to our principles and maintain the integrity and the reputation of the firm. That's success.